I'm Joe Bianca. I'm Bill Finley. I'm Jonathan Green. Flexibility, convenience, opportunity. Find your digital advantage in the Keeneland Digital Sales Ring. Backed by the most trusted name in thoroughbred sales. Visit KeenelandDigital.com to learn more. Good morning. It's 9 10, Wednesday, June 23rd. This is the TDN Writers Room presented by Keeneland. My name is Joe Bianca. I'm the associate editor of the Thoroughbred Daily News. And due to the unfortunate technicality of my name not being on the ballot, I will gracefully concede the New York City mayoral race to whatever corrupt weirdo we decided to elect this time. Good morning. I'm Bill Finley, a correspondent for the Thoroughbred Daily News. Jonathan Green, general manager of DJ Stable. And contrary to popular belief, I was not at Royal Ascot last week. Um, but also to quelch this rumor, it was not because I couldn't afford to rent a monocle. <laughs> they just didn't have a top hat small enough for you. I That's think exactly that. right. That's exactly right. You know, plus I did try on a tuxedo with with top, you know, top hat and tails, and I looked like Mr. Peanut. So I didn't want it. that was my for me. <laughs> Thus the monocle, you know. The TDN Writers Room was brought to you by Keeneland, home of the world's yearling sale. Make plans to attend the Keeneland September yearling sale beginning Monday, September 13th. Learn more at theworldsyearlingsale.com. All right, so I don't know if, you, if, if any of you saw this. If you haven't seen it, you should go read it. Last uh, Friday, the Washington Post released a story called The, the Dark Side of Bob Baffert's Reign. And it's an exhaustively researched really illuminating piece of journalism. And it's the kind of thing the Washington Post uh, and only a handful, I think, of real other outlets in the country really do this well, which is which are these deep investigations. And it, it, it really lays out a lot of, you know, kind of what Bob Baffert and his legal team have done over the years to keep him mainly from being suspended, despite a bunch of overages and a bunch of mysterious deaths and it, it really doesn't it does not reflect well on the California horse racing board or, or uh, some, some certain politicians in California as well in terms of kind of the way Bob Baffert, his legal team, have been able to worm their way into having influence in those uh, oversight mechanisms. But just I wanted to before I toss it to these guys, because there's a lot to talk about from the story, but I wanted to you know go over some of the key points. The. One, to me, the most interesting thing about the story and, and kind of the most damning thing about the story for Baffert is they had a, a, a list of the, the trainers who have had the most uh, catastrophic breakdowns per thousand starts in California. And Bob Baffert is right at the top with 8.3. Now, there is some discrepancy because California, I believe, counts training fatalities as well as racing fatalities. So this is overall breakdowns. Nevertheless, 8.3 is a gigantic number. If you're just going on the racing stats, it should be two or less. Even if you wanted to double that for training fatalities, he's still over twice what the normal trainer should have on his record. 8.3. I mean, there's some other names on here. Jeff Bondi, 8.12. Jerry Hollendorfer at 6.25. John Sadler, another big name on there at 5.62. Uh, so Baffert is not the only problem here, but I thought that that was a pretty damning statistic. And the story is terrific because it goes it goes through goes back to when and he had those horses mysteriously drop dead, seven of them. And there was a whole controversy about he was treating them with thyroxine and um, he's had horses test positive for morphine in the past. It's just there, there's there, <laughs> I, I'm looking at this stat right now. Um, he's, with all the violations he's had over the years, they've resulted in roughly twenty thousand dollars in fines. Twenty thousand dollars over the years from like thirty uh, overages against three hundred twenty-one million dollars in career earnings. Now, if you want to, if you want to just lay bare why the racing the racing does not have a deterrence system, there it is, right there. A guy who's made over three hundred million dollars in purse earnings equates to 30 plus million for him plus his day rate and has only been fined twenty thousand dollars for 30 you know at least in in this uh context crimes in racing and it it i don't know it, it just it, we, we've seen it we've talked about it and we've we've railed against it but just to see it laid out in terms of 
aggregate numbers was really shocking and really staggering to me. There's some other good stuff from the story, not good stuff, but interesting stuff from the story. So I'm, I'm going to get into it, but first I'll, I'll toss it to Bill for his thoughts. Yeah. I mean, again, there's so many different things you could talk about, but to me that I think the story within the story is what is something like this, a story of this ilk in the Washington post do for horse racing. And, you know, we're at a point in time with the media where the only time serious news outlets cover horse racing is maybe they'll run a Kentucky Derby story, but then the, the, the scandals, the breakdowns, the drugs. Remember, this is the same newspaper that ran an editorial basically saying it's time to ban horse racing. And, you know, the mainstream people that are not following the sport on a day to day basis, this is what they know of our sport now because they pick up the Wall Street Journal and say, I I think I've heard of this guy. Isn't he the number one trainer in horse racing? And whether you think the story was fair or not, I think it was reasonably fair. I don't really from a can't punch too many holes into it. But what a black eye for horse racing this is. And again, you know, we've talked about this with other issues, but, you know, these black guys just keep adding up, adding up, adding up. And, you know, I personally think we're in a more perilous situation than uh, a lot of people really uh, believe, or a lot of people think that things aren't that bad from a public perception point, they really are very, very bad. And that's why, you know, we talk about Hissa and how important that is. And Travis Tiger, come save us, come clean up the sport. And, and of course it's a very, very bad look for Baffert as well. Uh, you know, and, and they did do a good job. And that number that, you know, I, and even like myself, I know he had breakdowns, but I never really thought that he was any worse than your average trainer. I mean, I can't think of any high profile horses in the middle of a race that broke down or anything like that. But then you see that number and he's number one. Well, again, you know, that's just another black mark on his career and something that obviously people are going to look at as they make decisions going forward about should he be banned? Should he be suspended? Should uh, the owners of top horses give him their horses? Something they have to keep in, in, in mind. So bad for Bob Baffert, but for our purposes today and what I'd like to discuss or the thing that I'd like to bring up, very bad for horse racing. Very, very bad. Yeah, there, there's two things going on here, uh, you know, with with Bob Baffert. Number one is all his pending legal cases. And then number two is um, the court of, of, of public opinion. And in the latter, in the court of public opinion, um, he's he's guilty and throw away the keys. Uh, and and the statistics show it. And Joe, you mentioned it before. It was one of the, the, the key points that I wrote down were the, the deaths per start. It's just um, unbelievably astronomical in comparison to the averages of the industry. And again, we're all trying to get the averages down. That's what we're, you know, we're all going and kind of rowing in that direction. Um, but to be four times the national average is, is outrageous. Um, and then, you know, you, you mentioned also his career earnings, you know, in excess of $300 million dollars. Versus the the, the pittance that, that he was, um, you know, slap on the wrist fines that he received. What you also have to remember is every time a trainer um, retires or every time a horse is retired and stands at stud, it's common practice for the trainer to get a lifetime breeding right. So it's not just, you know, what he garnered from his purse earnings, you know, for, for the trainer's fees, as well as the training fees that you brought up, which is absolutely correct. But it's also, you know, the breeding rights that he has to all of these horses that have retired, you know, and it's been over a dozen, um, you know, that, that he has lifetime breeding rights for. So that could be, I mean, those stallion rights arguably could be overinflated by, you know, a hundred million dollars. And then that's not outrageous to think about it because, Kentucky has this, I know I'm digressing for a second, but Kentucky has um, the ability to say, we're only going to stand basically grade one winners. Well, if some of these horses that he had weren't grade one winners, then they wouldn't be standing there, which means that their stud fees would be lower and, you know, the valuations are lower, et cetera, et cetera. So, so it's really, I mean, it, it's far reaching, um, you know, some of these statistics as far as the money that changed hands, you know, because of these alleged infractions. Um, the other thing that I thought was interesting was, you know, just how vocal the jockey club has been in all of this. Um, and, and the Washington Post article, you know, was, was kind of a prelude to the jockey club's announcement that they were, you know, going to basically give a unique perspective is what they called um, with regard to the court system. And they're going out of their way to basically help the, uh, you know, the, the, the prosecution um, and show all of the issues that, 
the Baffert trained horses have had over the years. Well, you know, they own the information, the jockey club, basically through their various investments. So if they have a quote unquote file on him and a unique perspective of what's going on, then I can't imagine all the additional information that's going to be coming out during this court proceeding. I, I really think that Baffert doesn't just need good legal counsel. He needs a, a really good PR guy at this point because he's just getting raked over the coals, whether it's Washington Post, Saturday Night Live, um, you know, and everything in, in our industry that, that, that we talk about here. But, you know, for Craig Robertson, the, the legal counsel to come out and say, well, you know, this isn't really right, the right information because only, uh, you know, one of the 72 deaths weren't really his. OK, well, then we'll reduce the number to 71. You really made a big punch there, Craig. So I don't understand, you know, what it, it, it'd be best if, if I was their team, I would say, everyone just shut up and not say anything anymore. And let's not uh, try to, you know, sway the court of public opinion because we're drowning right now. Yeah. And, you know, I, I'm sure people that are that are listening and watching are sick of hearing us talk about Baffert. But I, this this story, I thought, was was really important because, like I said, it laid out stuff that we kind of assumed in terms of Baffert's level of power over regulatory bodies and even over politicians and over the entire sport. It really laid out specifically how he's wielded that that power. And I just I wanted to give a couple of, of examples from the story. Um, quoting here, in more than four decades in the sport, Baffert has faced significant regulatory scrutiny because of a high death rate only once, which is what I was referring to after seven of, of his horses collapsed during a short period of time at Hollywood Park. State investigators found that his staff was mixing a potentially dangerous prescription drug, thyroxine, into the feed of every horse in his care. But a top veter veterinary official cleared Baffert, finding that the spate of deaths remains unexplained, quote, following a probe that demonstrated the hazards of going after Baffert. Among them, according to interviews and records obtained by the Post, a push to have the veterinary official removed from office, supported by a trade group with Baffert among its directors. And take a guess which one that was. Um, it's, and, and, and this has been kind of the pattern, is he's, he's been able to get, go above the, the regulatory agencies and, and above the state and, and like, and, and kind of dictate what his punishments should be along the way. And it's kind of a, a self-fulfilling thing in racing where the more, the more you allow him to skirt the rules and, and accrue power and celebrity, the more leverage he has to say, look, I'm your biggest star. Do you really want to go after me and make the entire sport look bad? And that's what went on for years, if not decades, to where it – eventually blew up in his face where he couldn't do anything about it. And that was this Kentucky Derby case. And this was what we talked about after, after the time that the, the culture of, of looking the other way and, you know, just deferring to Baffert was always going to lead to this. It was always going to come to this to a point where he could not control the story and the narrative. And that's what we have now. And it's, and it's, and it's long overdue. And, you know, I'm, you know, I agree with Bill. It overall, so it's not a good look for horse racing, racing this story, but at least it adds to the transparency for us to figure out what's been happening all these years and to be, figure out a way to fix it. And like how insidious Bob Baffert's influence has been in racing, particularly in California. Another interesting tidbit from the story is um, it, 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 I'm quoting again here in a scheme typical of the high stakes warring behind the scenes in racing. Four thoroughbred owners entered talks in 2015 with a private intelligence agency to dig up drug-related dirt on Baffert. The owners ultimately abandoned the plan after Baffert's horse, American Pharaoh, won the Triple Crown that year, fearing their effort could damage the sport. That's what I'm talking about. That's exactly what I'm talking about, is you let this guy get to the top of the game and have so many recognizable, famous horses that are, you know, actually American Farrell bringing some positive attention to the sport for once, it becomes too risky to then crack down on him. And it, you know, it, it goes on and on. Like Rick Arthur, when he, the, he was the CHRB director and was starting to investigate Baffert for some mysterious unexplained debts. It just so happened that somebody in the California assembly introduced a bill that would limit his term. In, as a CHRB head and, and basically fire him as soon as he started investigating Baffert. And this is it. Like, this is 
this is this is laid bare the way that Bob Baffert and his legal legal team have worked and maneuvered to be able to game the system. And you know, he, you let a guy get enough power. It reminds me of of Congress and the way that Congress is broken in a lot of ways, where the people tasked with regulating certain businesses are basically selected by those businesses and those industries. Can we get a friendly guy to Wall Street in to head the SEC? That kind of thing. Can we get a big business guy to head the de- Department of Labor? And that's why so, there's so much corruption and so many, so many problems in Congress and the way America works. This is a microcosm of it right here with Bob Baffert. The guy who you're tasked with regulating has become more powerful than the system. And that's, that, that's what led us to where we are now. We'll be right back after this message from Keeneland. Multiple graded stakes winning racehorse like Decorated Invader or a potential future star like First Captain is attainable with a racing partnership with West Point Thoroughbreds. Partnerships enable you to spread your ownership across several horses for less than it costs to own one horse alone. This increases your racetrack action and your chances for a big horse. Learn more about why West Point Thoroughbreds is the gold standard in racing partnerships at westpointtb.com. All right, so we have a little bit of an update on the, the Arlington Park situation. We haven't talked about it in a while. We talked a bunch about it in the past when it was when the it was up for uh, up for sale and now we the Churchill Downs has closed the bidding process uh, for Arlington. Uh, we don't know exactly how many bids there are. There are only two that have been made public. Um, one is by the former track president Roy Arnold, and the other is by the Sh- Sh- Chicago Bears. The Chicago Bears. It was rumored that they were they were bidding on Arlington to potentially move the team from Soldier Field, which is in, in Chicago, to Arlington Heights. Um, and they, they sent out a tweet last week that, that confirmed their interest. What's interesting about, about these bids, and particularly Roy Arnold's bid, is that's, that's the only one we know that is going to attempt to keep racing at Arlington. Now, you know, maybe there are other ones that, that have not been disclosed yet, but that's the only one for sure that involves racing horses at Arlington, Arlington Park uh, beyond September. And just a quick sidebar, I'll be going to Chicago in a couple of weeks, first time at Arlington. So if you have any recommendations, hit me in the DMs. Um, but this is, I, I feel like I'm going to go and then be extremely even more pissed off that Churchill Downs did this to Arlington because um, it's it's supposed to be a, a beautiful plant. Uh, but I, I, Bill knows a little bit more about this or has been covering it a little bit more than, than I have. Um, so I wonder what the potential is for, it seems small, but it seems less small than before for racing to stick around after this year. Because the one thing that that I also noticed in, when I was reading uh, the latest story about this is that the, the mayor of Arlington, Heart, Arlington Heights was talking about, you know, being able to support horse racing in his town beyond this year. He was, he said, basically, we have a horse head on the, on the village flag. It's been very important to us and our economy for the better part of a hundred years. And it it seems like he's at least motivated for that to to have that, to have racing continue, but how much power in the end does he really have over this process? I wonder what Bill thinks. Well, yeah, the good news is that at least one entity uh, and maybe there's more has come forward and said, we want to keep horse racing at Arlington Park. Uh, that's better than zero. We didn't know that that was going to happen. But right now, this is the tip of the iceberg type of thing. We don't know how many people have bid. We don't know what their intentions are, the people that have bid. We don't know how much money they've uh, put up or, or will say that they'll put up for it. And most importantly, we have no idea what Churchill Downs is thinking. So at the end of the day, have we moved a little bit closer to maybe saving Arlington uh, as a racetrack, maybe, but we don't know. But again, what if the bid from the uh, ex Arlington president was? I mean, I have no idea how much these things might be worth. One billion, and someone else bid one point five billion or something like that. I doubt it's worth anywhere near that. But I'm just using those those out there. But the problem is, at the end of the day, it still comes down to Churchill. 
they don't have to sell it to somebody they don't want to sell it to. And remember, if anybody has any inkling whatsoever of wanting to put a casino in there, you know Churchill's going to shy away from them. Now, the good news is, I think that just reading the tea leaves there, Churchill is finally in a position where they kind of have to play nice a little bit. And the reason why is the politics, because they're still actively trying to get additional casinos in Illinois, which can't happen without the approval of government and various commissions and, and gaming commissions and that sort of thing. So, you know, they people in Arlington and, and Heights and in Illinois do care about saving Arlington Park. It's not like nobody cares. It's, it's a racetrack. Uh, now that Joe Bianca has been here, we're, we're fine. We can, can, can shut the door. So, you know, there's a lot more to, to go. But the Bears thing is very interesting because, um, you know, the movers and shakers, the powers that be, you know, as much as they'd like to have horse racing uh, stay there. There's nothing sexier than having an NFL, a storied NFL franchise come to your, uh, uh, come to your, your, uh, your plot of land that's now up for sale. So I, I think that's a very big threat at the end of the day. Again, we have no idea what the Bears, um, w- what their bid was. And I also read, and this is a good reporting, the Daily Herald. Uh, in Illinois covers all this stuff very well. So I'm just uh, regurgitating some of the things that they said. Um, but the um, they someone came up with, maybe we can have both horse racing and the bears there, which just, is there really enough room for that? I, I don't, that sounds implausible, but, but they said, you know, that so whoever they're quoting, whatever was writing said that, that is, um, that is something that they think is actually feasible. So again, this is the, just the stage one of a very long story. But at the end of the day, I would say good news that at least one outfit out there is working very hard, the Roy Arnold Group, to maintain horse racing in Arlington Park. And if you like this game, if you're involved in this game, you know, you have a rooting interest here. Root for those guys. Um, yeah, so th- this is this is better news. It's better news that we, we at least have one racing interested group in the process at least, but so much of the power, you know, still rests with Churchill Downs who are, who are selling the property. You know, this hasn't, they've never come out and officially say this, but the writing on the wall, the reason for them selling Arlington is that they have a nearby casino and does planes that they don't want competition for. And, you know, they're just a, a company that's built their entire fortune based on owning racetracks. Why would they feel any kind of loyalty to, to keeping some racetracks in America? Um, but but that aside, you know, like, like Bill said, that there's there's a there's a PR consideration here for Churchill Downs, because I think a lot of people have the pitchforks out for them, I think, with a lot of good reason that they kind of have to finesse this a little bit and not just be seen as, as driving a stake through the heart of Arlington Park and, and Illinois racing, which which would be what they would do if they would sell it to somebody who's not going to keep racing there. Um it's it's interesting the idea of building a complex like even the the Roy Arnold bid has a a a stipulation to put a minor league hockey arena there so I think overall no matter what happens at the at the very least Arlington is going to be downsized they're not gonna they're not gonna keep this gigantic racetrack there they're gonna they're even if Roy Arnold's team or somebody else who has some interest in keeping racing there wins the bidding process it's going to be downsized. They'll probably just keep the grandstand, get rid of the clubhouse, downsize the barn area, something like that. But that that kind of complex is interesting to me because, you know, I was out of, out of Belmont a few weeks ago and I saw the new Islanders arena, the UBS arena. It's really right next door. Um, and that to me is interesting. And it may be potentially a way that racing can stick around in places where the, the, the government or the company want that land for other uses. Now that didn't happen with Arlington, with the Hollywood park, unfortunately, how they just knocked Hollywood park down to build, eventually build the Rams stadium. And I wonder if, you know, there, there can be some kind of deals struck in the future where, you know, we, we keep racing, but we downsize our footprint enough that you can build something else, whether it's a shopping mall or an arena or whatever, and create this kind of mutually beneficial complex between us. And that's, that's basically what they're doing at Belmont park. There's going to be, you know, it's going to be all intermixed. And I, I'm actually pretty excited about that because, you know, depending on what they do with Belmont, they might have some, some twilight cards, which would be bad for us working at the TDN, but might be good for getting some spillover from Islanders games to come get people to walk, you know, 50 feet or whatever is and go, go check out the track who otherwise would not have thought to do that. So I, I wonder if that maybe is the future of tracks that are occupying, you know, an outsized 
portion of land relative to their their revenue, whether or not they can strike some kind of compromise and say, well, let's, let's build a complex that we can all benefit from. But so that, that that's just the update on, on Arlington right now. And, you know, I'll, I'll try to you know, shake some hands and rub some elbows when I'm over there and, and exert my influence as well to get them to keep Arlington running. But it's, it's good that at least we have some racing interested people in the process now, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll keep you updated as this progresses. Joining the West Point Thoroughbreds Partnership, you vault you into the world of instant camaraderie among people surrounding high-class horses and stakes action for a fraction of the cost of trying to do it on your own. Learn more at westpointtv.com. We'll be right back after this message from West Point Thoroughbreds. All the thrills. Fraction of the bills. Experience the power of the partnership. Change your life, make new friends, and compete at the highest level of thoroughbred racing. West Point Thoroughbreds, the gold standard in racing partnerships. Visit westpointtb.com. This week's TDN Story of the Week is brought to you by the Minnesota Racehorse Engagement Project. Find out how you can get involved in racehorse ownership at Canterbury Park this summer with several options and investments ranging from $250 to $10,000. Visit racehorseminnesota.com to learn more. So we've been covering this a little bit in the, in the last couple of weeks, but a, a, a bill legalizing fixed odds wagering on racing was passed unanimously by both houses in New Jersey. Um, is now going to go to Governor Phil Murphy's desk, who's expected to sign it. And the expectations, we talked to Janice, Dennis Drazen a little bit about this last week, but the, the expectations are that fixed odds wagering will be in place for the Haskell at Monmouth, which is July 17th. Uh, so there's there's a, a lot to talk about here, and and we might have a, a guest on in the future that could could explain it a little bit better. But Bill's been doing some some reporting on this. Um, I, I I have a lot of questions uh, in terms of logistically how this is going to work and whether or not it's going to work out because you know there was an ex- a similar similar experiment to this several years ago with the Betfair Exchange, which was first debuted at Monmouth and then expanded to a couple of tracks. And that didn't work out. Like that was kind of a disaster. It only lasted for about a year or so, even though it was a really good idea and was in the right circumstance, a good alternative to the, the tote. This is even better because it has a, 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 an international, you know, bookmaking company behind it from Australia. Um, so that's going to have th- that kind of infrastructure. Not that, not that Betfair is an inter- international company, but this, they're coming here basically with the sole purpose of making fixed odds wagering work in America. And I think it's a great idea. The takeout is only going to be 12 and a half percent. So that's big. Whereas a lot of most tracks have between somewhere between 15 and 20% win takeout. Some have a, a little bit more even than that. But I just wonder, it's only going to be available in New Jersey at first. That was a problem with Betfair. You didn't live in New Jersey. You couldn't bet it. Um, I wonder, you know, the, the guy from the company seems to be confident that it's going to expand to other states, but that might take time. You know, things take time to, you know, wind their way through the, the state legislatures and be signed by governors. This is a great thing, I think, to introduce into the American racing and betting atmosphere. But I, I'm just not 100 percent convinced that there's the appetite for it that there was in Australia, because the test case in Australia you know, exp- wagering exploded once they introduced fixed uh, fixed odds wagering. However, that's already a place where I think thoroughbred betting on racing has been at least on the incline or at the very least steady. Whereas in America, it's been on the decline for a while. So you're looking to reverse a trend here as opposed to in Australia when you were just trying to carry and build momentum. Um, but I wonder what Bill thinks. Yeah, I mean, a lot of thoughts here. Um, First of all, I'd like to back up a little bit. And whether this works or not, you have to give Monmouth Park a tremendous amount of credit. I mean, they're behind this, just like they were behind getting PASPA overturned and getting sports betting into Monmouth Park. Uh, That ultimately might be a bad thing for horse racing as a whole, but Monmouth Park desperately needed that to get through some of the the, the more troubled times uh, financially. Uh, So 
you've got to do this. In this sport has problems. We need change. We need to improve. We need to do things differently. So you got to go out there and try things like this. And I hope the other jurisdictions involved, be it racetracks or racing commissions or whatnot, have that same attitude. Hey, maybe this won't work. Maybe it'll cannibalize our betting on the paramutual a little bit on the tote. But you know what? We got to try this. We have to be out there doing things uh, t- to make ra- give racing a better chance. Uh, you're right, Joe. There's a you know, it's, it's almost like with the Arlington Park thing. This is the tip. I said, use the cliche tip of the iceberg. Uh, there's so much we don't know. First of all, what other tracks are going to be available besides Monmouth Park? So uh, when I talked to the guy from uh, Betmakers, he didn't want to tell me the names of the track, just said he had a bunch. Again, it's a huge difference if you have Naira, Keeneland, Santa Anita, Gulfstream versus if you have Emerald Downs, Penn National, and, um, you know, L- Podunk Downs. Is, Honor is Park. Well. Exactly. Hey, that's personal. Okay. Yes. Fodder part. Uh, And it also, you know, how long is it going to take for uh, this to spread beyond New Jersey? And with the sports betting framework out there, that'll probably make it a little bit easier. He suggested states that already have sports betting could easily make the transition into doing this. But Joe, I will say that after saying so many positive things about it, I'm with you. I'm not sure it's going to work. I, I'm really not. You know, just because it worked in Australia has doesn't mean it's going to work in the United States. Betters in different country have different betting appetites, different preferences. And in England, where Betfair is huge, everybody just bets the win or each way, win in place. They're not into pick fours. They're not into trifectas. They're not into superfectas, et cetera. That's what the American gambler is really into. So just because it worked in Australia doesn't mean it's going to work in the United States. However, again, just like with Arlington, you got to root for this. Let this be a great thing. Let it catch on. Let sports bettors get, hey, you know what? I bet um, I, I bet the Oklahoma City Thunder tonight at, at plus 180. And but look, I want some money. And now I can bet this horse in the fourth race at Monmouth tomorrow at plus 350. That's really neat. I want to do that. Let's hope that this all happens. I'm a little bit skeptical, but I'm again, being a guy that's in the industry, I think you have to root for this thing. And and for somebody who doesn't bet, you know, in, in you know, a lot, if any, and that, that, that would be me, um, you know, I don't really have a dog in the fight in that sense. Obviously, the more that's bet, the more that goes into the purse accounts, the better it is, you know, for the owners. Um, but I can tell you from talking to people who are betters, Nothing is more frustrating. And Joe, you've mentioned this before, and Brian's mentioned it on the podcast. Nothing is more frustrating than betting you know, money on a two to one, only to see it midway down the pack that it gets all of a sudden it blips and it's six to five and the horse wins. That has got to be so infuriating where not only you pick the right horse, but then you get 50% of what you thought you were getting when you actually made the wager. Um, and then there's a higher takeout. So I think it's a great opportunity especially with the lower takeout of 12 and a half percent is really low in, in, you know, from, from what I've heard it compared to other, other uh, gambling opportunities. Um, but just the fact that, you know, when you put your money down, that if you see value in a, in an odd uh, and the odds on a horse that you really like, and you plunk your money down, that's the month, that's what you should get. Um, so I think it's a great opportunity. The problem is that, that betters for the most part are really slow to change. So unless there's some kind of incentivization or some kind of, um, you know, a, a freebie or something. I don't know how they're going to market this, but I think they have really one chance to kind of get this through. And if they can get some of the bigger betters um, or more influential betters to jump in and say, hey, this is really cool. I bet on, I saw value in this five to one shot first time starter and it paid, you know, $12. I think that's where you're going to start to see momentum being built on these, uh, you know, on, on the fixed odds wagering. Yeah. I mean, so, several points there. Yeah. This does, address the problem of late odds drops, which are, which are infuriating to betters and doesn't exist in any other wagering game that that does not exist. It's a, it's a frustration exclusive to our sport. So it, it gets rid of that. Um, like John said, the betters are creatures of, of habit. So I think that it's going to take an adjustment period. And I don't, you know, I hope that that bet makers is in it for the long haul because it might be, there might be some slow adoption especially if it's only available in New Jersey. I hope that it'll move to, to other states that are legalizing sports betting. And sports betting is the key because this, two things, it integrates uh, your sport better with sports betting and the pricing is more is more competitive with sports betting. So that's a huge thing. And we should be trying to, to kind of glom on to sports betting and, and, and be in partnership with the, the sports bet takers you know, as as these things develop, you know, to, to get on like the DraftKings sportsbook or the or the FanDuel 
sports book and, and have people be able to make, you know, parlay bets. Like if I want to, if I want to bet um, tonight, if I want, who's playing the Hawks and the Bucks, if I want to bet the Hawks money line and then parlay it with a horse at a, you know, Indiana grand or whatever at a fixed odds price, then you get that commingling and you, you, you get at least on people's radar to bet racing and, and they're, you're not doing it at a 20% takeout. You're doing it at 12 and a half which is much closer to the 9%, which is standard for sports betting win wagers. So I think it's, it, it can only be good if it works out. And if we're able to kind of finagle our way into the sports betting landscape and into the to sports betting's reach by doing this. So like Bill, I think we, we, we have to root for this. There is, you know, there's reason for skepticism, but I'm going to be very, very interested to see how this progresses and what the handle is like, because I think it's going to be telling as to whether or not this is this is going to be able to be scalable for the rest of the country, because I, we're, it's it's without a doubt a great thing and a very and a potential positive. But, you know, it's we have to see the way it works here in New Jersey first. But, you know, like Bill said, also hats off to, to Monmouth Park for always being the 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 first to market with these kind of things and these kind of experiments. Cause that that's, that's absolutely huge. And we need more people trying stuff like that in racing in order to grow the sport. Joe, I would throw out there that I think that the, the powers that be, you know, should give you some free wagers um, being that you're such a, an influencer, especially in that generation um, in the younger generation, the, you know, then uh, the, you know, that maybe they should give you like a thousand dollar credit and let you tweet out what you're betting. Um, and, and keep the winnings. You don't have to keep the original thousand, but that, that would be my recommendation to, to, you know, to the powers that be is that Joe Bianca should be the face and, and, and name of the, uh, you know, of the marketing campaign for you. You know, I think Bill is laughing and I can't tell from John's face whether or not he's serious. <laughs> no, um, I'm serious. But I'm serious. You know, like when, when Betfair first came, Brian had that deal. Brian was, was doing that kind of thing where he was writing up plays to promote the Betfair exchange. So yeah, Betmaker is, Call me up, hit my DMs, email me. I'm happy to promote this thing. And yeah, anything, anything that, that's, that gives me more FaceTime is great. But I'm, this is something that I really support as well. So I wouldn't be, you know, selling my soul to, to, to promote it. This is a huge thing. Yeah. Thanks, John. It's, I no, it's, it, uh, you'd be a perfect face for that. Just like Bill is the face for Preparation H. Oh, exactly. my God. Jesus, what, what happened to you in Maine? You're like, you know, <laughs> I missed you ever. guys. I missed you so much. Yeah, Dude, he exactly. takes a week off and then comes back and it's yeah. just and singing. And it's, <laughs> yeah, you just needs that, that, that little refresher every now and then. <laughs> we'll be right back after this message from the Minnesota Racehorse Engagement Project. TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Legacy Bloodstock. If you think that 50 years combined experience in the horse business could benefit your program, give Tommy or Wendy a call. They personally advise on each horse as if they were their own. All right, so not a ton of, of big re- racing last weekend. Uh, this weekend, we do, we do have the Stephen Foster card coming up at Churchill. It's a nice stakes filled card, seven stakes races. Stephen Foster, unfortunately, is no longer a grade one, it's a grade two, but it's also, it still should be. A great day of action. This past week, there were a handful of great stakes, but the one that was the only one that I felt was interesting and noteworthy uh, was Oleksandra upsetting the poker stakes at Belmont. She was 17 to 1. Now, she won the Jiper last year against Males, was, it made her a grade one winner. Uh, and then she had kind of fallen off a little bit since then. And then she also uh, RNA'd for 1.45 million at facing November in the fall. It brought her back this year as a seven year old. She stumbled a couple of times and then beat Raging Bull on the square in the poker. Raging Bull was odds on, obviously, a, a multiple grade one winner. And she, she had to cover more ground too. She had to cover, she had to go wide. He came up the rail and they met at the 16th pole and she turned him back. I thought it was a really, really nice effort. But the, the interesting tidbit about it was that that was her 
uh, career finality finale because she's pregnant. She's pregnant to into mischief. Neil Drysdale said it after the race. That would be her last career effort. It's a very uh, admirable race mare and one that came from Australia as well. I'm always interested in those horses that can run well in multiple hemispheres. Uh, I wonder if John has any thoughts as an owner, probably looking to get a horse like her every once in a while. Well, you, you, I mean, that, that's the kind of, you know, when you lay your head on the pillow and you close your eyes, those are the kind of fillies that you want to have. Um, just that, that not only, you know, we're grade one winners, but also ended up on top. And, and, you know, it was just a great story to see not only because of the reasons you mentioned, she was a little bit out of her element going a mile. She was running against the boys. They bypassed another stake race previous to that because of the soft footing. So they really wanted to give her 20th and final start of her career, um, you know, the best chance possible to win. And, and it wasn't an easy victory. Um, and I'm sure it's not easy for Team Valor to, to kind of retire her now, albeit now she's pregnant to, into mischief. Um, and that's a good reason why. Uh, you know, she was coming off, you know, a, a, a disappointing Breeders' Cup effort, quite frankly, and 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 they brought her back. Um, and then she ran kind of a couple of so-so races and, and really peaked at, at the end of her career, which is a really, really wonderful thing. Um, the, the, the interesting aside, somebody asked me, you know, uh, during the course of this weekend, um, you know, if we had ever run a horse pregnant before that we knew. Um, and, and actually, the answer is yes. And it was at Monmouth Park, uh, believe it or not, Bill. Um, and, and Bill, you'll remember a, an old turf filly of ours named Rolf's Ruby, who, sure. who ran until she was 10 years old, actually. And we brought her back for her, her, her 10th year. And because she was a turf horse, we didn't run her during the wintertime because we didn't ship out of out of the mid-Atlantic region. We bred her to, um, you know, a, a local horse, OK by You. And actually, we put her in for a claiming price of $32,000 because we actually had to announce that she was pregnant in full to OK by You. And thankfully, OK by You is no longer with us. You probably don't even know who he is as a stallion because he never produced anything. But we actually had to, in the announcements and on the claim box, they actually put a little post-it that said, Rolf's Ruby in full to OK by you last breeding day, you know, February or whatever. And she actually won that day pregnant um, and thankfully wasn't claimed. But it would have been like a two for one deal if somebody had actually claimed her. Yeah, now, I remember the first time as a racing fan seeing that announcement that a horse was running in full. And I was like, they yeah, can't that. Your mind, right? Yeah, no. And, and maybe it maybe it, it, it stokes a little bit of competitive fire just based on these two. Two examples. There, there are some theories. That, believe it or not, there yeah. really are some theories that that it does, you know, give enhance a horse and and give it, uh, you know, a little bit more juice, for lack of a better term. Um, you know, I don't want to. I don't want to. You know, read a couple of months from now that uh, that trainers are giving horses, uh, you know, pregnancy tests to see if they're, you know, if they're pregnant, and 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 that way, you know, it'll it'll help uh, enhance their racing careers. Um, but yeah, it was interesting to see Alexandra win, and there was all kinds of hype about, oh, into mischief already has another graded stake winner. Um, you know, in, in utero. But I think realistically, she's going to sell for more this year, um, obviously, because she's unfolding into mischief. But also, you know, coming off that that kind of bad effort in the Breeders' Cup, I think put a bad taste in a lot of people's mouths. Um, and also the fact that not a lot of international buyers were there um, at the it was actually the Keeneland. Right. Um, and uh, and I think that's why, uh, you know, she was RNA for one point four five million. Um, incidentally enough, she was the highest RNA at that Keeneland November sale, 1.45 million. I, I can't imagine owning a horse of that caliber and sweating it out, putting like a million five reserve or a million, nobody knows what the reserve is, but obviously it was in excess of million, you know, four or five. And just having to sweat that out and see whether or not you were going to get that. That's, that's really high stakes poker there. Yeah. Uh, and apologies to, to Keeneland. It was at Keeneland November. Um, yeah. I was going to ask, first of all, I, I'm surprised that John, passed on the opportunity to use his favorite phrase, a little bit pregnant. She's a little bit pregnant. She was definitely um, pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I was going to ask you like over under, like she probably, I, I'm, this is, this is just a novice guess, but I feel like it's probably going to be close to twice what she RNA for last year because of the, the circumstances you're talking about with more international buyers. She's got that other win. She's pregnant to into mischief. Yeah. I wouldn't know. I wouldn't say necessarily twice, Joe, only because she's older. She's definitely older. And, and a lot of people who are going to put up that kind of money, um, you know, they want to have if the horse hits, they want to have the horse for, you know, 10, 15 years as a broodmare process. She's only one year older, though. 
Yeah, but 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 it, when th- by the time she falls, it's two years older now. So she'll be, you know, she'll be eight years old at that point. You probably say, well, what's the big deal? Well, that foal won't race until she's 10 or 11 years old. And then already she's kind of on the, you know, on the on the peak, on the almost on the downside of breeding. So it, it's really hard to to imagine that she would bring, you know, three million dollars. Now, you know, I'm talking to the guy who bid six hundred thousand dollars on a horse at the very first sale he was at. So maybe. Uh-oh. Like, 2.9 just to prove that you're right yeah, can we defer to the expert here do i have to fly down to Kila in november just to prove you wrong if you're gonna bid 2.9 million dollars on the horse i'll guarantee you that team valor and or keelan would pay for a private plane <laughs> to go down we'll there. take it yeah, yeah all right exactly, exactly. We'll, we'll just see it. how much money you make from betfair you know from from your appearances from betfair as being a uh, an influencer yeah uh, to john just just doubling as my agent i really appreciate that I'm here for you, my friend. I'm here yep. for you. Thank you. Your, your true friends build you up. <laughs> we'll be right back after this message from Legacy Bloodstock. Being a small family business, I guess we're part of a dying breed. We're really grateful for the people that entrust us. We know it's a huge responsibility. We're always with your horse. Every step of the way, when it comes to being at the sales ground, showing your horses, we are with your horse. Just driving up down the road every day, there's not a time that I don't look out and feel a responsibility to the sport, the animal, the people that come to invest in the game. I want to see as many people enjoy this sport as they possibly can because we do have the most beautiful sport in the world. The Green Group Guests of the Week are sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. With over 500 clients in the horse business, they have proven strategies to save you taxes. Learn more about how they can help you at www.greenco.com. So our Green Group Guest of the Week, this week, we are thrilled to have him as the president and founder of Eclipse Thoroughbred Partners, Aaron Wellman. Thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me, guys. Appreciate it. Great to have you. We, we think of you as kind of one of the pioneering guys in the in the ownership side of the sport. So and you've had some big news recently in the past week with uh, Quick Susie winning the Queen Mary at Royal Ascot. And I wanted to ask about that off the jump. Um, we've seen you and Eclipse with more particip- participation at Royal Ascot in recent years. Obviously, we saw sharing run a great second in the coronation stakes. I think back to Teppin and kind of how that maybe set the bar and, and motivated people to go try Royal Ascot as American interest. Can you talk about why you have decided to get more involved in shipping horses overseas there? Sure. Well, European racing is something that's intrigued me since I was a young boy growing up here in Southern California, always enamored by Bobby Frankel getting all these beautifully bred Judmon horses that came out and seemed to do so well. So it was something that intrigued me from a very young age and I studied quite intently uh along with my parents who were small-time breeders here in california so it sort of started there and then really just evolved as as my career within the industry did so this is something that has been intriguing to us from the outset of eclipse we actually had our first royal ascot runner in 2012 just a year after we launched the company and then had a bit of a dry spell because we didn't want to show up to the party without uh, the goods so to speak and really didn't take anything over until last year when we did uh, venture over across the pond with sharing and she was a gallant second in the group one coronation that was a little bit different because we were taking american horse to the uk for royal ascot which was a whole unique endeavor into its own but this was a uh, more simple process with quick susie so to speak because she was already based in Europe. She was an Irish filly that we bought after she broke her maiden at the Cura. And we had designs on her becoming a Royal Ascot filly, whether it was the Queen Mary or the Albany, we didn't know at the time, but uh, we kept her over there as our partners in Eclipse have become more sophisticated over the years. Uh, the ability to keep horses in Europe without having to export them immediately to the States has become more prevalent. And thankfully, Quick Susie uh, got the job done and, and made us look all like we had done the right thing. Aaron, good morning. Thanks for joining us. And again, congratulations on a great win over at Royal Ascot. Um, I was interested in the trainer, uh, Gavin Cromwell. Admittedly, I really don't follow European racing. So, but of course, I know who Aiden O'Brien is. I, of course, I know who Michael Stout is, et cetera. It's, but this is an unfamiliar name to, to me. Uh, but uh, why did you team up with Gavin Cromwell and tell us his story? Yeah, Gavin's a fascinating guy, actually. I didn't know much about him before we had bought Quick Susie, but 
it's not uncommon for Eclipse to purchase horses, whether it's domestically here in the States or abroad, and keep them with their current trainer for the time. We sort of figure if it ain't broke, then why try to fix it? So with designs on running Quick Susie back so quickly in the group three at NACE after she had broken her maiden at the Kerr, we thought it was best to keep her with Gavin. Gavin's got a really fascinating history in the industry. He actually started off as a blacksmith. He was a farrier and uh, is predominantly a, a national hunt uh, jump trainer over hurdles. And he's one of very few trainers in history, I believe, who's won a race at Cheltenham with a hurdler this year and a race at Royal Ascot with a two-year-old filly going to five eight. So he is a horseman through and through. Uh, an incredible feat to accomplish a, a Cheltenham winner and a Royal Ascot winner, such diverse uh, and, and extreme opposite type of training jobs that he had to do. But Gavin's done an exceptional job. He's been really good to communicate with. And our intention was to bring Quick Susie over to the States after Royal Ascot. But after her triumph there last week, it was certainly hard to peel her away from Gavin and we're going to keep her there for a race or two with designs on coming to Del Mar for the Breeders' Cup in November. And Aaron, one I know you're one of the hardest working guys in the business because, you know, we like to think that we work hard. And it seems like whenever I'm trying to buy a horse privately, whether it's domestic or international, they always say to me, well, yeah, Eclipse already made an offer. And I'm sure most of the time that's true. Um, you know, they're not just trying to run us up. But uh, but you guys have have a far reaching um, effect on, you know, on buying horses privately. Have you found that your investors have more of an appetite for buying, um, you know, ready-made horses or, or they're still very excited about going to the yearling sales and two-year-old sales with you? It's a good point, Jonathan. It's, um, we made a point when we launched Eclipse about 10 years ago to really try to prove ourselves at being good at just about everything in terms of trying to buy horses. We believe that a good horse can come from anywhere at any time. I really cut my teeth early on in the game, first starting to claim horses because that was sort of the immediate action way to go. And, you know, you sweat out what's underneath those bandages when you get them back to the barn. And then it evolved into trying to buy horses privately going overseas, importing them to the States. Um, but when we started Eclipse, it was really with the intent of, yes, making made horses a big part of our buying process. And our partners certainly enjoy that genre. Uh, but we've been very fortunate to get support from our partner base at the yearling sales, as well as the two-year-old sales. And we've been very lucky to buy uh, grade one winners and classic winners out of the yearling sales, out of the two-year-old sales as well. So it's tough to be really, really elite at all of those avenues by which you can acquire horses, but we've certainly done our best to provide our partners with a variety of opportunities year in and year out. And uh, the track record, fortunately, has spoken for itself that our partners continue to believe in the process, whether it's at the yearling sales, the two-year-old sales, or buying horses privately. One of the most expensive yearlings I remember you guys getting it on was Taprit. And I think I see the Taprit saddle cloth right behind you there. And obviously that was a huge success um, for you guys. He's got his his first yearlings coming up. He's, he's um, I think, one of the more exciting young sires that, that's coming up, especially as a, as a son of Taprit. Can you talk about what that's like to see someone, you know, a horse that had that kind of success for you on the track, become a stallion and per, perhaps have that influence going forward and how much are you guys involved in looking forward to, to buying tap at the sales? Yeah, I mean, look, that's the pipe dream, right? To buy a horse at a young age that ultimately evolves into a stallion prospect. Now, Taproot was bought with those intentions. I can't say that for about 99.9% .9 of the horses that we buy on an annual basis, but Taproot was the first horse that we went and spent seven figures on. It was at a yearling sale. It was at Fasic Tipton, Saratoga. We lined ourselves with Mr. Malone of Bridalwood Farm at the time and Bob LaPenta. So uh, we had some strength in the partnership and certainly went out on a limb to purchase him as a yearling for $1.2 million. And I'll tell you what, there were some dicey moments there in the early phases of his uh, development. He was uh, a pretty ornery colt getting broken at Bridalwood Farm under the tutelage of Jonathan Thomas. 
We sent him up to Todd Pletcher at Saratoga. He wasn't really showing much. I think we ran him Labor Day weekend at the Spa going seven eights. Didn't pass a single horse, ran dead last. We had to regroup. We went down to South Florida, got him to Gulfstream Park West, which is not really where you want to be after the summertime with a $1.2 million tap at Colt. Uh, but he broke his maiden going long. And from there, it just sort of clicked. And Todd Pletcher did what he does best, which is train horses. We got a stakes win at two, which is really important for his stallion making pedigree uh, and resume. And then, you know, he just started to get better and better as a three year old. Obviously, we had high hopes for him. He won the Tampa Bay Derby in track record time, went to the Derby, ran a sneaky good mid pack six behind Always Dreaming. And from there, it was all about the Belmont and he got the job done. And there's nothing like winning an American classic uh, that put him on the map that put Eclipse into a different level, uh, so to speak, from where we were to that point. And obviously, Gainesway Farm showed extreme interest in him as uh, an attempt at the heir apparent to their marquee stallion, Tap It. So uh, Mr. Beck was so gracious and, and his partners. And we got the deal done, campaigned him for another season. And now we're starting to see these babies hit the ground, which is really exciting. We've made stallions before at Eclipse, uh, but none with the profile of Tapperit, a son of Tappet, out of a great one winning mare. He himself a classic winner. And the buzz is really positive all throughout Kentucky right now. And I'm anxious to get out to Fazek Tipton in a couple of weeks for the July sale. I think he's got nine or 10 catalogs. So we're certainly going to take a good hard look at all those babies. And, you know, we've got a vested interest as does Mr. Malone, as does Mr. LaPenta in, in trying to make sure that these taprits uh, land in the right hands and give them every opportunity for success. So it's exciting stuff and it's exciting for our partners to see that process as well. Aaron, I want you to talk about the story of Ohio, a horse that at 10 years old won a stake race, albeit a, a minor one at uh, Turf Paradise this year. But to be able to do that at age 10, remarkable. But he has been retired, and it's one of those feel-good stories. Still running well at 10, retired, you know, reasonably sound and with no ill effects from his racing career, and is now going to go on to a second career uh, as an off-the-track thoroughbred. So just tell us more about Ohio. And I can see a little smile coming on your face. Obviously, this is one of your favorites. No doubt about it. This is a unique story for Eclipse because he was one of, I don't even know if there are two or three claims that we've made in the last 10 years since we launched the company. But Ohio's a horse that came from Brazil to Southern California several years ago. It was a horse that caught my attention early on in his career here in Southern California. I always liked him. I thought he was a cool horse. And, um, you know, a couple of years ago, I was feeling no pain because the day prior we had just run one, two in the Providencia. I'm sorry, within the honeymoon with, uh, with paved and a Philly called animosity. So the next morning I was just scouring the PPs and saw that Ohio was in the first race in for a $50,000 tag and his form had tailed off a bit. You know, it was clear that his best days were behind him or it seemed as though his best days were behind him, but put together a little group. We claimed him for the 50 along with partner Bruce Treitman for uh, Michael McCarthy and uh, we played a little bit of horsey poker going back to my original claiming days because we took him for 50. He was dead last that day going down the hill at Santa Anita. We took our time, got him to Del Mar, dropped him in for 32, took the weight, put him in for 28, and he aired that day. And from there, he just got his confidence back and he got really, really good. Ended up winning the Frank Kilro uh, mile, which is a grade one at Santa Anita. Amazing feat for a $50,000 claim. So exhilarating for our partners. Michael McCarthy did an incredible job with this horse. But one thing that was really cool about him is that we won a race called the Cotton Fitzsimmons Memorial with him three years in a row. And last year, uh, Ohio had fallen on hard times. He had some nagging injuries, nothing major, but just some little stuff that was preventing him from finding his top form again. He was just a cut below the best you know, graded stakes horses out there at a mile or thereabouts. So we gave him almost a year off with the intention of just trying to make it back for the Cotton Fitzsimmons to get that three-peat. And kudos to our partners for making it happen. And Michael McCarthy and his staff did an incredible job. So that was one of the more gratifying moments. Uh, it might not have been the most high-profile win for Eclipse, but it was certainly gratifying for myself, my business partner, Brian Spearman, and our partners, because this was really a labor of love to get him back. And, you know, he's a horse that had had bleeding problems throughout his career. 
which is, I think, why he came here from South America to begin with, so that he could run on Lasix. We knew we were going to be up against it if we wanted to run him in graded stakes, because in most of these races, he wasn't going to be able to be medicated with Lasix. We tried him one time to see if he could hold tight up uh, at Golden Gate, and it just didn't fare well. And at that point, we said, hey, look, he owes us nothing. It's time to find him a good home. Called a longtime friend, uh, Maggie House Sack, who uh, I grew up with working on the backside. She's the daughter of, of Mike House, a prominent owner here in Southern California. She had just started a new farm and uh, went out there, visited. We got it done. Ohio's out there with two other grade one winners that actually all ran against one another. Hunt, Gabriel Charles, and Ohio are all either in the same paddock on any given day or next door to one another. And they're now riding horses. And we're going to try to transition Ohio into riding horse for my daughter, Sadie, who's uh, uh, an aspiring equestrian at the age of 13. So it's really cool. He's a cool horse. It's a feel good story. And um, really, uh, I hope something that the industry gloms onto and, and it's becoming more prevalent that people are really, you know, following suit and taking better care of their horses and their post-race careers. So uh, it's something we're very proud of. That's a great story. And, and you're right, as owners, we need to do those things. We need to give back because it, when, when we buy these horses, we're not just buying them for their racing career, we're buying them for their, their after career and their secondary career. So I, I applaud that decision. Um, Aaron, you know, you're, you're one of the, the young shooting stars in the industry and, and you're on a number of boards and, and doing, you know, you get a lot of opportunity to get in front of the camera and, and, and talk to journalists as well. When investors come to you and say, why should I invest in the horse industry when you guys have all these issues going on? You got all these problems. Um, you know, how are they fixing them? How, why should I invest in, in a horse? And I know you don't use Baffert, but, you know, there's a Baffert kind of spillover. How, how do you like how do you explain it to people who aren't really in the industry um, and are thinking about becoming in the industry? But, you know, we're kind of dodging bullets on some of these issues. It's a great point, and it's certainly a barrier to entry. It's a conversation that I have with just about every prospect or prospective partner that comes through Eclipse's doors. And really, uh, I think that the industry is slowly but surely making good strides towards appropriate reform. Uh, it's never enough and it's never fast enough. But you know, speaking personally, as far as Eclipse is concerned, we just really try our best to stress to uh, our partners, our existing partners, because that's uh, a sustainability issue as well. You know, you don't want guys leaving out the side door either because they get fed up with the, the negativity surrounding the industry. So it's not just trying to bring new people in. It's trying to sustain the people that we've got and cultivate those relationships and make them comfortable uh, with their investment in the industry. Um, we prove it to our people that are existing partners, but what we have to convince people of that come to Eclipse seeking to participate in our partnerships is we try our best to surround ourselves with good people. And, you know, we've always believed in that philosophy. I think if you look at our roster of trainers uh, who we give our horses to, uh, they're not just outstanding horsemen and predominantly hay, oats and water type guys. Uh, with relatively squeaky clean records. I don't think there's anybody out there that, you know, has escaped uh, the bullets that are fired out them at all times. Uh, but if you look at Todd Pletcher, you look at Graham Motion, uh, you look at Mark Cassie, you look at uh, Bill Mott and Patty Gallagher and Michael McCarthy and those types of trainers that are constantly saddling horses under the Eclipse banner. Those are guys that are uh, really pillars of industry who also talk the talk and walk the walk. So it's really about surrounding yourself with good people. Um, as you mentioned, I am on a few boards uh, throughout the industry and uh, you know, I am a big proponent of the industry getting more serious about the penalties that are being handed down to trainers in particular uh, who are violating the rules. We can't allow anyone, I don't care who you are, how big you are, how small you are, to operate by a different set of rules, no matter where we are. Uh, there's no question that we need a unified, centralized governing body here in the United States to oversee the industry. I think the Horse Racing Integrity Act is a good step in the right direction. 
that won't give us all the answers. But at the end of the day, we need uniformity. We need to have stronger penalties for trainers. And I don't want to just single out trainers. Uh, veterinarians need to be held more accountable as well. And uh, certainly owners too. You know, uh, if you're going to make an investment in this game, you've got to have enough sophistication uh, to be able to know when something smells right and when it doesn't. And we've got to start just making sure that we are holding the right people accountable. And it's got to start at the top and it's got to trickle down. And, and I know these are generalized sort of theories that I'm discussing, and it's probably a, a discussion that needs to take place on a, on a different platform with a lot more time. But uh, those are the general concepts that I believe in big time. Uh, I think that even though it's frustratingly and agonizingly slow right now uh, for us to weed out the bad actors, uh, due process needs to take place and hopefully justice will be served. And I think once we start to get going in that direction, the business is going to thrive. And that's what I really try to stress to these prospective partners or existing partners to get to your point, Jonathan, which is this is a good thing that's happening right now. For too long, we've swept issues under the rug. We've protected guys because we were concerned about the public image and guys that are too big to fail. Maybe it would be worse for the industry to expose them rather than to protect them. Uh, but we've been accomplices for too long. We've aided and abetted for too long. And it's really high time that we uh, took swift and, and serious action. And that is the point is that we're going to get better. We're going to get healthier. There's going to be a more level playing field and it's going to inspire confidence for more people to participate in the industry, whether they're gamblers putting $2 through the windows, breeders that need to buy brood mares and pay stud fees or owners uh, you know, like yourself and Eclipse and everybody else out there who really has a vested interest and puts on the show day in and day out. Excellent. I appreciate the choir there. That's an excellent, excellent way to put it. And I, I suggest you watch the first segment of this show when it posts the too big to fail thing we were talking about specifically. And that's 100% the right point. Aaron, thank you so much for coming on and for the insight. Really appreciate it. Congrats on all the success, especially last week. Thanks. Thanks for joining us. Pleasure. Really appreciate it. And thanks for the work you guys do. It's awesome every week. And uh, thank you, Aaron. Keep at it, man. It's I know it's a I know it's a, a thankless job, but uh, keep at it. And the stories are great. And it's just it's just good stuff for the industry. So I applaud you guys and appreciate it very much. Thank you, man. We really Thanks, that means a lot of fun. appreciate it. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. This is this week's Green Group Guest of the Week, Aaron Wellman, who receive a free one-hour tax consultation. Learn more at greenco.com. We'll be right back after this message from The Green Group. The Green Group is widely recognized as the top-rated tax and accounting firm specializing in the horse business. Why do the top owners, breeders, pin hookers, and trainers trust the Green Group as their tax advisors? The difference is experience. Firm founder Len Green has over four decades of experience owning, breeding, and racing horses. First-hand knowledge gives Green Group clients proven tax and money-saving strategies. Visit the Green Group at www.greenco.com. The Green Group, proven strategies to save you taxes. All right, so that's going to do it for this week's edition of the TDN Writers Room, presented by Keeneland, home of the world's yearling sale. Make plans to attend the Keeneland September yearling sale beginning Monday, September 13th, and learn more at theworldsyearlingsale.com. I want to thank Bill Finley, John Green, our Green Group guest of the week, Aaron Wellman, our producer, Patty Wolf, our associate producer, Katie Ritz, and our editors, Anthony LaRocca, Aliyah LaRocca, and Nathan Wilkinson. Thank you so much for watching. We will see you next week. Mm -hmm.